Before I transitioned, I feel like I didn't really pick something that I just loved doing. But after I transitioned, I didn't have this sort of weight on my shoulders about who I was, and I was able to go out and explore different things, like field hockey, like singing, like writing. And because of that, I'm just a better person. Over the last year, we have seen an unprecedented amount of anti-transgender legislation introduced across the country, particularly targeting youth. In the interest of centering their voices, we have created a space to hear directly from young trans and non-binary folks about what brings them joy. My trans joy is creating celebratory representations of members in my community. What obstacles stand in their way. Anyone telling your story for you and then telling it wrong, how do you contend with it? And what we can do to fight for their future. In every culture, trans kids will keep coming out. Will they be supported or will they be harmed? I'm Raquel Willis, and this is Logo's first ever Trans Youth Town Hall. I know one of the big spaces that is really important for us to have affirming care is, is within healthcare, right? And so who has been able to find like an affirming doctor? Okay, I, I see that it's a little bit complicated. Let's dive into that. It took a while to find even like an endocrinologist. It's, it's like somebody else is telling me who I am mm -hmm. and why I still can't be myself oh, you need to wait a little bit longer mm -hmm. because you don't know who you are yet. That was like, I, like a cannonball through my chest because I was like, I've been feeling this way mm -hmm. since I can remember. In DC, plenty of gender affirming um, providers. In Bradford, Pennsylvania, I got a lecture about God and I was there for a concussion, you know? There was nothing about my transness that mattered in that moment. And also, mm -hmm. it might be a little TMI, we'll talk about it, but finding Things like reproductive health care. Um, for example, I really needed plan B and I called a thousand and one different doctors and I was like, can I take this with testosterone? And they were like, you can't actually get pregnant. You're a man. And I'm like, look, look, you know, um, I know what my anatomy is and whatnot. So yeah, space matters. It's absurd at some point because some of these people haven't met like a trans person in their life. Wow, okay, we're going there, we're going there. <laughs> I mean, I've had countless experiences with doctors who could not understand that the gender marker on my insurance card didn't match the girl that was sitting in front of them. But I mean, also hormones. I went off hormones because they became financially inaccessible to me, which thankfully led me to a different realization in my journey that my transness is not um, measured by my choice to be on estrogen or not, which is, you know, a whole different conversation. But unfortunately, the realizations that I've come to with my understanding of my own gender, although I'm happy that I have come to those understandings, they've only been introduced to my mind because of the difficulty that I faced accessing equitable and safe healthcare. Yeah. I mean, Ali, can you share? For, you know, normal checkups and stuff, I still have to go to a normal doctor. It's kind of a little uncomfortable. I don't know, it just feels weird. But I go to a doctor for LGBTQIA plus healthcare and just feels safer. I fortunately have been able to have a healthcare provider that really understood me and really got me. I go to a gender clinic and we talk about where I want to be in my future, how I see myself currently, and just what we can do to start building on my portfolio of who I want to be in the future. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow, a gender clinic. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. When I have affirming and supportive healthcare, I'm able to thrive. I'm able to to be me and just be happier. And I think that's one of the most important parts about um, getting healthcare because it's, it's for me, not you. Why would you care about it? Trans healthcare is under attack all across the country. I know we all get questions about this day in and day out about what we can do, what other people need to be doing. 
Oh, yeah. No, that, that it's so real. And I think that one of the things that I really struggle with when fighting back against these bills is watching these families and the fear that they're living with every single day. And one of the things, too, as a parent, you know, a lot of the rhetoric around these bills is about how, oh, this care is experimental and it's untested and we don't know this or that or the other thing. And I think there's two really important things to say about that. The first is we know a lot about this care. It's been around for a long time. It's supported by every major medical association in the United States. As parents, the other thing we know to be true is pediatrics is all a lot of unknowns. We take a lot of risks. We don't know about a lot of things. And what we do as parents is make the best decisions we can with our doctors and with our children. And what the states are doing with these bills is saying parents can't make these decisions. And also, the solution to support and keep young people safe, especially trans young folks, is listen to whatever they tell us keeps them safe. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it doesn't correlate to us, even if we didn't need it to keep us safe, letting them be the stewards and being excited to listen and, and, and be led by them, because they also ain't gonna wait, honey. They'll push you out the way. <laughs> With love, auntie, move over. The fact is, trans kids will keep coming out, and then it's just a matter of will they be supported or will they be harmed? And that's really, it just comes down, that is one binary that, that, I, that really okay. is true. They will either be hurt or they will be helped. Yeah. <laughs> and at this point, it's really up to the people who are involved in those states to make sure that state power does what it's supposed to, which is to help and not harm. One of the important issues in our community is also around safety. So we're gonna do another show of hands, but who feels safe on a daily basis? I see a little here or there. Being in this big city, I feel fine. I feel good, I feel safe. But when I move to places like Kent, where mostly everyone is white, and there's a very big conservative population there, I find myself feeling anxious. There are still sundown towns that exist in Ohio and across different states. And so thinking about, for example, getting pulled over and a cop saying something and then me going to jail, the idea of being stripped and searched and having to deal with that fear of where are they gonna put me and what is gonna happen, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's also the issue, particularly when I was in college, you know, I had instances where I would go, you know, use a certain restroom or whatever and still kind of deal with like the weirdness, whether it was just looks or even staff walking in and being like, oh, you can't be in here. Um, so is that still an issue for folks too? Um, I mean, when it comes to the bathroom, I only was able to l allow myself to go to the men's bathroom about probably a week ago. Just because I, even though I don't identify with being a woman, I am terrified of going into um, a men's bathroom because of the violence that I might face. And being socialized as a woman, it comes with a lot of fear of men. And I can't shake that. College was a little bit of a different story, but my overall understanding of school was that it was a, not a safe space. Um, and something that I understood very early on in my transition was the link that had been drawn for me between my trans identity and the undeniable experience of violence. I was jumped in the locker area and the only person that got suspended was me for using profanity at school and nobody in the video who was seen attacking me was suspended. And that was a trend and in high school, I was, again, beaten in front of a large crowd of onlookers. In one hand, they had a phone, in the other, they were pointing, laughing. And I was, as I was bleeding, the boy that hit me said, it don't matter because that's a man. Wow. And nobody in that moment stood up and took any sort of stand against that violence. And so from school to school, a norm was set that violence against her is okay. I mean, I wanna say I'm so sorry that y'all have had these difficult experiences. And I think what's so important about your bravery and sharing the story is that y'all get to kind of correct the story that's out there about our community. 
Can we just kind of talk about the ways that we can protect trans youth? You know, call me traditional, but <laughs> I think <laughs> your mom, at least, but your parents should be the, the one or two people in the world who support and love you no matter what. And again and again, when I meet trans youth who are flourishing, who basically have lives that are indiscernibly different than their cis counterparts, it's because they have a parent that treated them like that. Zaya Wade is flourishing, and many people will attribute it to access to wealth and so on and so forth. And I'm like, all I really see is that this child is loved with abundance and there's no limits to how they are sheltered and cared for. That can be replicated. Not everybody's daddy gonna be Dwayne Wade. Not everybody gonna have a Gabrielle Union walking around the house, you know what I'm saying, giving you full bring it on tease. Not everybody gonna have that <laughs> space. But every person can be radically loved and have these boundaries moved. It's a cis narrative that when you come into your transness, you will be unlovable. But for those of us who are trans, you know, we know that our fullness creates more love around us. Completely, I mean, he said it so perfectly. That was my biggest shock when I came out as trans. I was better across the board because I was more myself and I wasn't, I didn't have that internal conflict, all those anxieties that had driven me for so long. You know, one thing that was so empowering for me was having my mom support, right? When I told her, she was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. If the woman who made my life possible has me guarded and protected and loved, then I can do almost anything. And you're proof of that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, to all the trans and non-binary youth out there, I hope I can count all of us as a part of that welcome wagon, that love train for you. There are people out there waiting for you. Hi, I'm Emily. My pronouns are she, her, and we're from Loudoun County, Virginia. Hi, my name is Mac, and my pronouns is he, him. When I grow up, I want to be a soldier so I can do the awful courses and get strong and I can save the world. Max came to me about two years ago and stated that he was a boy, um, he wanted to change his name, he wanted a haircut and I just felt that Max was expressing who he wanted to be to me and I just wanted him to feel okay and safe and loved by, by me. So my family's Catholic and we voted um, conservative and then a lot of it did change based on my son. For the first time in my life, I felt like my son is being discriminated and I had never gone through that and never felt that. I want these kids to grow up be who they feel like they want to be, and just, I want people to leave them alone. They're just children, <laughs> and it's so unfortunate. My hero is mommy, because my mommy supports me. So our last one is, what is one relationship in your life that has improved since you've transitioned? I think that my relationship with my family has really, it's, it's brought us all together, whether it's like, Having the, the deep conversations that I don't have with anybody else with my mom has definitely brought us closer together. And like with my dad, like now I'm like one of the boys, like as stupid as it sounds. It's just like now we have that father-son relationship. Probably with my dad. He was the first person like I had ever come out to. And it helped a lot because I was able to feel like myself around him um, and that I didn't have to hide who I was I would say my mom. She has been the biggest support of mine. Um, sorry, I'm getting emotional. No, um, okay. When I first came out, no one in my family knew. And so one day I was in the car with my mom and I'm like, hey mom, I don't know how you're gonna feel when I tell you this, but um, I'm questioning myself. I'm, I'm a part of the community. And she accepted me right off the bat. And June ran around Pride Month. She's like, do you wanna to go to a Pride Parade? And I'm like, yes, please. She's like, okay, I'll drive you there. Uh, we get there and I see these people and they all have their Pride flags. And that made me start sobbing. And it's because I couldn't see myself at the time with those people, with that community. And I'm so excited to be those people who I saw back in my past. Mm. So beautiful. Definitely my moms. They just helped me find myself. 
they don't really get it sometimes, but they're supportive and I love them so much. I think I've become more authentic in my relationship with myself and that allows me to be more authentic with everyone else and open because I'm me and I'm here and that's huge, so yeah. In part three, we'll explore the role trans representation plays in changing the hearts and minds of the American public and what it means to trans youth.